lockdowns, mass surveillance, forever war. Is this still the land of the free? It will be again. I'm Eric Brakey, and it's time to free America now. Because an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Free America Now, our weekly video cast. I am your host, your renegade statesman, Eric Brakey. Thank you so much for joining me today. We got a great episode and a great guest. I'm looking forward to introducing you to. You know, part of the message of Free America Now is that if we're going to win our freedoms back in our country, it's going to have to happen in the states. You know, they say the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's exactly what the political strategy has been on the right for a long time in America, going after trying to fix things in Washington, D.C. I don't know how many times we're going to have to try to change things in Washington, D.C. before we realize that Washington, D.C. cannot be fixed from the inside. It's going to take people standing up from the states, people running for their state legislatures, people engaging their state government, and getting the state governments in this country to be the ones who stand up to the tyranny coming out of Washington, D.C. One of the states really leading the charge in the fight for freedom and liberty is the live free or die state in New Hampshire. I've got to say, as a Mainer, sometimes I get a little jealous of all the liberty that's happening right across the border in New Hampshire. Uh, but so many great things happening since uh, the uh, liberty movement there has become incredibly powerful, has elected people to the state uh, legislature. Now, liberty Republicans are the majority of the majority in the state legislature, and they're getting all kinds of great things done, from slashing state spending to passing uh, educational savings accounts for real school choice. So many great things happen in New Hampshire. And today, I have a friend who's with a movement in New Hampshire called the Free State Project, bringing in people from across the country who believe in that mission statement, live free or die, to come, relocate, move to New Hampshire, and make New Hampshire the free state it has always declared itself to be. We're going to be talking about some of the accomplishments for liberty in New Hampshire over the course of the last year, and what may be some opportunities on the horizon in the year ahead. Her name is Carla Garrick. Hey, Carla, welcome Hi, back Eric. to Free America Thanks now. for having me. Thanks so much <laughs> hey. for having me. <laughs> well, the pleasure's all mine. I think in the past I have called you the, the, the most interesting woman in the world, and I, I, I mean that in all seriousness because when I read your biography, your background, and everything you've accomplished in your life, uh, you've led a very interesting life already, and now you are working with the free state movement to, to, challenge, to challenge government tyranny on the state and the federal level. Uh, so glad to have you back. I guess, uh, you know, some may have heard your past episode on the Free America Now audio podcast, and I know we went in depth a little bit on your background and some of that, but could you just tell folks who may be watching uh, a little bit about yourself and how you got in this fight for liberty? Sure. So um, I'm originally from South Africa and I grew up in a diplomatic household. So I sort of traveled and lived all over the world. Um, and then while I was in law school in South Africa, my parents had entered me into the green card lottery and I won a green card to come to America. And of course, I was like, yes, please. That sounds like an awesome opportunity. And uh, finished my law degree in South Africa and then got married and moved to America. We ended up in Silicon Valley where I work for Fortune 500 tech companies as a lawyer. I started out as a paralegal. I had the very typical immigrant story, came with two suitcases. I had $7,000, lived in the Tenderloin in San Francisco in a one bedroom, well, not even a one bedroom, a studio apartment with a bath in the kitchen, uh, you know, junkies, a crack house. I mean, it was the whole thing. Worked my way up slowly but surely, retook the bar, got some great jobs, did the dot-com bubble, and then did the bust. And <laughs> that is where I got interested in Austrian economics. Thanks, Alan Greenspan. 
right? <laughs> you know, they, they, they keep creating opportunities for us, you know, much like the inflation we're seeing now is really going to start to push the crypto markets in an interesting way. So uh, left San Francisco in 2001, put all our stuff in storage, packed two backpacks, went backpacking through Southeast Asia, India, and Africa uh, for about, it ended up being almost three years. We're living on a $15 a day budget. It was really, you know, it was an experience. I really used a lot of that time to learn about Austrian economics, sort of reading up as an immigrant, you know, you, you, I mean, I became a citizen, so obviously I had to pass the test, but really, you know, going a little more in depth into the constitution. And then I'm a little Ron Paulian, you know, I discovered Ron Paul and he was my dude and I liked what he had to say and um, learned about the Free State Project in 2003, got moved out in 2008 and then got really heavily involved. I served as the president from, I think it was uh, 11 to 16, triggered the move, which is the mass exodus of kind of bringing libertarians to the state of New Hampshire. I've run for Senate a few times now. I still chair the FSP. I serve on a lot of boards. I write books. I, you know, I'm just living my best self. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> well, let me ask you, as I know, uh, you know, I had you on the audio podcast for kind of a, with a discussing kind of the history of the free state project, but I, I we don't need to review all of that, but let me just ask you, I guess, real quick, quickly why of all 50 states in this union why was new hampshire chosen as the state to to for to um place the free state project in because i know many states were considered even even my home state of maine was considered and yep. sadly uh sadly wasn't the one you guys chose but um why was new hampshire chosen for the free state project so uh, there are 101 reasons, and now there are probably hundreds more, but uh, there was a lady who actually made a list of the 101 reasons why New Hampshire should be chosen. So back in 2003, it was this like 10 state scorecard and people could say, oh, which one? You know, and all the usual suspects were on there. They're mostly smallish states, low population, uh, low taxes, you know, so Wyoming, the Dakotas, Maine, you know, again, all the usual suspects. Uh, New Hampshire, of course, uh, I think ended up winning primarily because there was this push from the locals to say, we want you guys. At the time, the governor was Craig Benson. He was a one-term governor, but he was a very pro-markets guy. And he actually said, you know, we welcome you to the state of New Hampshire, please come. So in 2003, we took the vote, New Hampshire won. Um, I was in New York City at the time and started coming up here. Um, you know, at the time I was like, New Hampshire, where's that? You know, what's that about? And came up and honestly, I've, I've genuinely fallen in love with the state. And don't worry about Maine when we have our loose Arcadian Federation. We'll we'll let you guys in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm looking forward to that. If it if it ever comes time for uh for divorce from Washington, DC, it'll be nice to know that we've got some fellow liberty lovers right across the border in New Hampshire and we can uh, watch each other's backs. Um but this year has been, or this year, this past year, 2021, was a big year for liberty in New Hampshire. I mean, of course, you had the 2020 elections at the end of 2020, where you saw a huge wave of liberty legislators, liberty Republicans in particular, getting elected to your state legislature, flipping the legislature from Democrat to Republican, the only state in the entire country in 2020 where the legislature flipped hands from uh, and this defied all of the predictions of the pundit class who had predicted that Democrats were going to do just fine in New Hampshire. In fact, they were probably going to expand their majorities and the opposite. The opposite happened. I know young Americans for Liberty, we love to brag and, and take a take a chunk of the credit for that, for oh, all yeah. the all the doors that our our liberty loving activists went out there and knocked for some of these liberty candidates. But um, but of course, you know, you through the Free State Project, you guys have brought in so many people who not just people who are, you know, voting and running for office, but but also people who are helping to promote just a general culture of freedom 
uh, in the state of New Hampshire. I know that this has really irked some of the uh, maybe the <laughs> southern New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts types. Um, I know I, I, I feel like every other day I see on Twitter the Free State Project kind of retweeting something from the Democrats in New Hampshire complaining about the Free State Project and uh, saying, you guys are giving us the best advertising we could possibly ask for. Um, what has been, um, I guess, tell me a little bit about, I mean, it seems like we're at a tipping point. Uh, for, just from an outsider looking in, it seems that the Free State Project is at a real tipping point uh, uh, right now. What? Uh, tell me a little bit about 2021, uh, some of the victories and, you know, some of the good things that happened this past year. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we all lived through 2021, so <laughs> there was a lot of bleakness, but genuinely for us here, there was, there was a lot of light, you know, as you mentioned, we had a ton of people who got elected uh, and thank you, Yell. I think 63 of, uh, you know, we had 63 of your endorsed candidates who won in New Hampshire. That was 25% of the people uh, Yell endorsed. 74 people who were endorsed by Rebuild New Hampshire, which was sort of, it started as reopen and became rebuild. 91 from the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance folks got elected. And then 40 people who actually admit or are out as free staters got elected to the House, including the House Majority Leader. So that's kind of how we kicked off the year. The sad news for me personally was I didn't win my Senate race. But honestly, I got 44% against a establishment dude who's in his 80s. Every bad bill that has ever been written in New Hampshire is his fault. The emergency you know, legislation that they used last year and the year before, that was something he wrote. So. I'm feeling fairly confident that, you know, this November is maybe going to look a little different. Awesome. Um, so are yes, you going to run again? I think so. I'm going to give it one awesome. more shot and then, and then I'm officially running for president of New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> one more chance. <laughs> Um, but, you know, so over the months, we, we've seen a lot of growth and you're absolutely right to say this is our moment. Why? Because totalitarianism is good for the liberty business, right? All these people have been awakened, right? The minute you start to have this conversation, and really we are having a global conversation about self-ownership, about freedom, right? Maybe not everyone is looking at it this way, but, you know, I was in a conference at Mi Mi in Miami last week. And it was just, it was really uplifting to be able to tell people, don't just think about the, the depressing stuff that's happening. Think about the fact that it is actually a, an awakening or a reawakening that we are talking about bodily autonomy. What are your choices? Can the government force you to you know, do things against your will? No, of course they can't. So I think what happened was, uh, people are looking for answers. They're looking for solutions. And we were just early, right? I mean, I moved out in 2008. The idea has been around since 2001. And it just makes sense that we're growing and, you know, expanding and getting more and more people who are interested. I also think there's an element with technology that we should admit. Um, it's going to be a tipping point because of the censorship we're now seeing, but we are still a little or good enough in the game at the moment to be able to get the message of the Free State Project out. So I think it's, it's exciting because it's a solution driven project, right? It's a project, it has the name right there in the name, right? So it's kind of like, what are you gonna come make of it? But it's also for people who are sitting at home and kind of going, something doesn't feel right. Maybe I should be hanging out with my kinds of peeps, you know? And so so I think we're gonna see more of that. I, I believe, and history so far tells us this is the case, you know, at the turn of the 18th, 19th century, there were, I don't know, there are like 70 nation states, I think, and now we have more than 200. So the trend is towards decentralization. And I posit that why can't we as humans go, different people have different desires, we have different values, and we shouldn't all have to be forced to, to come together. And of course, if you're a federalist, you know that 
the states were supposed to be these laboratories. They right. were supposed to be able to experiment. And we were supposed to go, wow, what are the good ideas? What are the bad ideas? And let's adopt more of the good and less of the bad. As the federal government grew, and I mean, they're out of control. They're, it's bananas. Like It's just not good. Okay. You know, I think, uh, I think there's this push again back to states' rights. And we're certainly mm -hmm. seeing that. I mean, we're seeing it with the discussion about national divorce. We're seeing it with, you know, Texit, Nexit, Cal Exit, uh, Brexit even, you know, they went in England, of course, first, that sort of created an opportunity, at least for the discussion. So I think other than in 2008, where we had a really big wave of people who came in, that was my wave, and we kind of called that the first 1000 movers. And that was very much sort of, um, pushed along or, or the impetus was the Ron Paul campaign. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we, we surpassed that now over the last year, we've had literally thousands of people moving. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a bit of a housing crisis. So, you know, we have some work to do on zoning because, uh, you know, we need to be able to build more houses and bring in more people. So it, it's been really exciting. Um, if I have to mention like some top things that happened, you know, we're number one in school choice now. We passed an incredibly great school choice bill. Uh, the money follows the child as it is, you know, having served things, you know, could go a little wrong at the state house. So they did put an income requirement on that, which we will work to take out this year. Um, Sometimes you, can't like, get the, sometimes you can't get the whole loaf. So you take half the loaf and then you come back for the other half later. Yeah. And, you know, the, the older and grayer I get, the more I'm like, oh, OK, I do see the value in some incrementalism. Right. You have to take the wins where you can take them and, and, and then try again. And that's an important message because, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. And as we have a lot of young activists who come in, people can easily get discouraged because they're very optimistic. They try something once, it doesn't work. And then they're like, oh, I'm never going to do anything again. And it's like, no, the point is we do it once it doesn't work. You know, it's the whole moving of the Overton window. So, you know, school choice is done really well. We have an extremely robust um, homeschool, unschool community here a lot. I would say that Actually, I don't know if I could back this up, but my gut tells me the majority of free staters probably do homeschool. Um, and we have a lot of charter and private schools that are being opened by free staters. I believe there are now three, two are open and one more in the works. So that's a great idea. We have a phenomenal education commissioner, Frank Edelblu. He ran against Chris Sununu um, for governor and lost oh, by close to a thousand votes in the primary. So it was close and, and he got he got Ed because I think Chris didn't want him to run against him again, right? <laughs> and that, um, that's and, one way to get rid of your rivals is put them on your team. <laughs> sure, right? I mean, you know, we should learn from the best. It's a, it's a strong political family. Papa Sununu's got some, you know, magic. <laughs> Um, so, so school choice has just been absolutely huge. That's been exciting. But then also we were the only state that actually cut, cut taxes. We are, we are ending dividends and interest tax. Uh, it's being rolled down in increments, but it's going to go to zero right. so that when we claim and, we are as. And this is income, the last remnant of the income tax. So this is like exactly. the income tax. Fully abolished in New Hampshire. Not, not you know, it, before New Hampshire advertised, right, no income tax. But you looked into the fine print and it's like, oh, well, I'm getting taxed on this, getting taxed on that. That's gone now. That's huge. Yeah, that is, um, that is huge. And I believe that will help us attract more wealth. Uh, you know, ideally, I would love to see New Hampshire. I mean, I would like to see it be a cute little independent country, kind of like Liechtenstein or Luxembourg, like Switzerland was in the, the old days, and have it be a place where, you know, first of all, we would have crypto investment, but we'd also have wealth protection, maybe have people start their companies here and all of that. So we really are moving in that direction. So dividends and interest taxes went down, rooms and meals taxes, which is kind of a big chunk. We're a big tourism state. That is where we get a lot of our money in. And even that has 
has been reduced. I think it was reduced by half a percentage and it's gonna go down a couple of points again. Um, we, we, you know, we now have body cams on all our police that took years and years. And, uh, you know, and that's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart because, you know, I was arrested in 2010 for filming police officers during a late night traffic stop. I got, you know, arrested. They charged me with wiretapping. I ended up, uh, they dropped the charges. Um, and I was like, well, you made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> arresting me and now you're gonna pay <laughs> and uh and I sued them 37 counts of violations of my civil rights it took four years went all the way to the first circuit prevailed it is a landmark case it's frequently cited and that wow. case basically says you can film police officers in the execution of their public duties uh don't interfere so like don't jump in the middle and uh, they do not have qualified immunity. And that is a really big deal on these cases because we do know that given sort of what we've seen over the past maybe 10 years, really culminating in all the violence and the you know, bad stuff that was happening nationwide with the protests. I'm like, I'm all for the protests, but I'm not for the destruction of private property. So, you know, right. you got to find that balance between your anger, legitimate anger and a desire for reform and, uh, you know, and lawlessness and just doing what you want. So, um, so we now have all our police officers do wear body cams. That's a pretty big deal. And then another cool thing that happened last year that that I'm also very proud of is I serve on Right to Know New Hampshire. And that is a uh, nonpartisan, you know, just open government advocates, right? Left, right, everyone who's just like, yeah, we'd like to know what you guys are up to with our money. That doesn't seem like, you know, something that is untoward to expect. And, um, and we had this list here in New Hampshire, which was called the Lori's List, got rebranded as the exculpatory evidence schedule, the EES. But anyway, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a list of uh, corrupt and questionable police officers. Uh, the list is kept by the DOJ, uh, the New Hampshire DOJ for Brady stuff. So that's just basically like you, you have to disclose to the defense attorneys that, oh, there's some issue with this this particular uh, witness or this particular police officer. Mm -hmm. And so they had kept this list for a long time. And we actually had a judge who in 2019 ruled that, man, this list should probably be public. You know what? You guys have a list of bad cops. Maybe uh, <laughs> people should know who those people are. And, you know, they sat on it, fought it, fought it, made personnel excuses, the whole thing. But uh, I think it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So suspiciously, you know, any any news the government doesn't want you to know usually drops right before a big holiday, right? And so they dropped the Lori's list uh, or the EES that night and it came out. And so we now have a public list of officers and people can start to really hold hold their police accountable. I am not one of these people who thinks all police are bad. I am someone who believes in individualism. Uh, but I will tell you, I do think if you rise through the ranks, you're probably getting less good as you go up. And so um, there is work to do on the reform. But that, you know, that was a issue that was near and dear to my heart. So I feel like we are making progress on important issues. Well, you know, there's there's so much, I think, kind of worth unpacking there. I mean, first of all, I, I agree with your sentiments exactly that. Uh, you know, ha wanting accountability in law enforcement does not necessarily mean you're anti-law enforcement, right? In fact, I want freedom-loving constitutionalist people to serve in these roles. I'd rather have people serve in those roles than uh, than those who don't respect the constitutional rights of the of the people they're supposed to protect and serve. And certainly, uh, having accountability, you know, when there's uh, when there's someone who's abusing their authority in these institutions, that casts a shadow on everyone. I think it's it's good for law enforcement when there's accountability and when people who are abusing their power are uh, are held accountable. It, it 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 allows I think I think it allows the people who are doing their role properly to um, 
to to serve to serve in a you know to serve in a better way without so much uh, uh, suspicion thrown on them for being affiliated with people who are abusing their authority. But I want to get back to something that you said um, uh, earlier on, which was the value of federalism, the value of uh, you know those of us who believe in federalism understand that the states were supposed to be the laboratories of innovation, and and I and and I just think this is so important, and this is our path forward. Now, of course, I think that you know in a in a uh, you know, in a decentralized union like we're supposed to live in, I think it's certainly valuable to have some certain minimum standards and expectations for, you know, people's basic human rights, like, you know, so as far as, you know, outlawing the enslavement of people and, 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 and demanding that all states within the union have some certain basic respect for the civil liberties of, of the people. But that beyond that, does that really, following from that, does that really mean that we're supposed to have one size fits all education programs in America, one size fits all healthcare in America? Why does it seem that every single public policy area in uh, in this country is increasingly being dictated in a centralized fashion from Washington, D.C., oftentimes not even by our elected officials in Washington, D.C., but by unelected bureaucratic agencies where power was basically voted to them decades ago and has never been never been revisited or questioned ever since. This isn't how our constitutional republic was supposed to be. The states were supposed to be the laboratories of innovation. And I feel like in America, we are at each other's throats so much these days because we've lost sight of this idea of live and let live. The, the idea that, you know, New Hampshire is different than California. And perhaps the policies that people want in California, maybe they even work for California. But I'll tell you lately, they don't seem to be working for California, despite the fact that people keep voting for them. But, but you know what? If California wants to live under policies of tyranny, I suppose that's the business of California. But for the, those in New Hampshire or Maine or Texas or other parts of the country, you know, I feel like we should be able to say, that's fine. You want to do tyranny in your state, you do tyranny over there, but leave us out of it. Let us live free. Let us not have these government busybodies, you know, dictating how we do our school systems, how we do our healthcare systems, how we do. Uh, I mean, even it's, it's crazy to think that even bathroom policies in public schools are now a matter for the Washington, for the federal government in Washington, DC. I mean, how, how did we get to this point where our federal government is so intimately involved with everything that even even down to bathroom policies in our in our local community schools has to be decided by uh, uh, by these folks in, in the city hundreds of miles away? It, it, it's amazing. And so I, I love what you guys are doing there. Um, in terms of fighting back against, I know there's been so much COVID tyranny to fight back. You guys have been fighting back against the, that there, but but I'm really convinced that it's going to take states standing up, and New Hampshire's really leading the way in this regard. States standing up, invoking the principles of Jefferson and Madison. Uh, you know the the right and the responsibility of states to nullify unconstitutional federal laws, whether they be unconstitutional mandates and edicts from the president of the United States or unconstitutional, you know, uh, uh, laws passed by the Congress. It's going to be, it's going to require the states to stand up and say, you know what, we're not going along with your gun control, you know, uh, 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 policies, you know, that's, that's not your authority. You know, you're, you're, uh, uh, these are null and void within our state borders. And I, I, anyway, um, so a lot of, a lot of victories in New Hampshire, of course, this year, from education to uh, to to uh, abolishing the income tax, you guys passed a budget that actually cut spending from the year before, which I've never seen before in all my years <laughs> in politics. I've seen it talked about a lot, but but to pass a budget that spends less this year than in the previous year, I've I've only ever seen that as a pipe dream of conservatives. Uh, everything Wait. and the, yeah. Go on. We, we, we actually have done it once before in 2010 when Bill O'Brien was the Speaker of the House. It was right after, you know, I moved in 2008 and I was still like, oh, what's happening, you know? <laughs> and uh, and they cut the budget by, I believe it was $2 billion, with a B, dollars wow. that were real cuts. 
Now, or maybe it was 10 billion because, or whatever the number was, don't quote me on it. But I do recall that 10 years later, it was right back up there. So for every 10 years that we cut, it comes back, it comes back, it comes back. And, you know, to your point about federalism versus, you know, I, I, I call DC the hell mouth at this stage from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know? I'm, <laughs> I'm a big like... Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, so I know exactly what you're talking about. This is yeah. where all all these supernatural evils just converge there because it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, and, and so um, I think we have to follow the money, and I do think we have to acknowledge that there is a challenge that is happening, right? The, the, the federal government is too big. That is actually why everyone's so upset, right? When you talk about the polarization and the sort of like pitting of the people against each other, I think some of that is manufactured because it actually helps strengthen the federal government. Now yeah. we're going to see how, how that plays out. Yeah. But the I think there's definitely is, a divide and conquer strategy that we're all in the midst of. Yeah, but the, the problem is, I think that they can't allow the competition that would come from some actual free states, right? So, so the challenge becomes, if you contrast some place that becomes more and more prosperous to you know, a state right next door, let's take New Hampshire and Vermont, but you know, in Vermont, you can make $37,000 now just living off the dole. But it's, you know, the state's bankrupt. It's like, I don't know what they're doing. It's, you know, it's, it's not going to succeed. On the flip side, New Hampshire has this growth. We have people coming in, people, you know, we can't keep up literally again with our housing. And so I think the challenge and, and whether this is on the federal level or an actual national as well as international global level, I mean, I, you know, call me a tinfoil hatter. There is definitely a push towards, uh, you know, a, a vast globalism. I think they really are trying to, you know, uh, turn everyone into a little commie. I think they want to put us in pods and feed us insect gruel. And, um, and so it becomes in the same way, and a good example would be China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, right? Or, or you know, uh, look what happened to Hong Kong. They were like, we can't let the outlier stay there with prosperity, yeah. free markets, reducing poverty, making life everyone better. else can see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so I think that is interesting. And I do think that we have to acknowledge that because it is, you know, you have to understand your enemy and why they not even I mean, the enemy of liberty. I don't regard anyone as my enemy. They're just people who make poor choices, you know, so they're the enemies of liberty. And um, and I think that, you know, we're going to have to figure out what that's going to look like. Um, an example would have been, you know, kind of what happened with Europe and with Brexit, right? But then COVID happened. And so now we don't really know. Apparently, Boris is just, you know, another one of those politicians. And, and so surprise, there we surprise. go again. But hopefully we can, you know, hopefully we can do some something really interesting and um, novel and innovative and growth oriented in New Hampshire. And then, you know, maybe, I don't know, at a minimum, all those uh, globalists could come park their money here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is interesting. I mean, we, we are at such an interesting time in America. And I know it's in a, in a, in a time of increasing tyr tyranny. I, I know I saw uh, the Cato Institute just ranked New Hampshire as the freest state in the country. Uh, and I know, um, <laughs> you know, I have to imagine it has something to do with, uh, you know, the, the courage I've seen in New Hampshire that I haven't seen in other states, which is to resist the temptation of federal dollars. This is because this is one of the mechanisms by which Washington, D.C. controls the states. And I, and I don't think I don't think the American people, by and large, get this um is you know washington dc cannot impose its tyrannical policies across the country without the complicity of the state governments and the way that it gets that complicity is it steals our money from us and it ransoms it back with strings attached so and everyone, at a discount so they take oh, it, yeah. you know they take a dollar <laughs> but they only give you 70 cents back too right 
Well, ab- yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, all of the special interests get the Washington, D.C. special interests get their cut of your money before it comes back to you. And then when you do get that whatever's left over, when you do get those scraps from the table back, they're always conditional. Oh, you want these federal highway funds? Well, you better pass these policies that we say that you have to pass, whether they be, you know, speed limits or seatbelt laws, or what with the dr- the drinking age? These are these are all law. These are all these are all policies that the federal government never had any constitutional authority to set. Whatever you think about the policies, someone might like the seatbelt law or the speed limits or with the drinking age where it is. We can have policy debates on those sorts of things. Personally, the seatbelt law is a particular just like I just, it just it just drives me crazy. The government, I'm for wearing seatbelts. I'm all uh, hey, you know, I think you're stupid if you don't. But at the at the same time, I don't like the government sticking a gun in your face and saying you better do this for your own good or else. Um, And that's, of course, what's always behind every single government policy. There's always a person with a gun threatening consequences if you don't do what you're told. And that, hey, that's fine by me if we're talking about protecting life, liberty, or property. It's not fine to me when we're talking about doing things in your own personal life that affect no one other than yourself. But New Hampshire is the only state in the entire union that, to date, has told the federal government to take its money – I guess really our money (laughs) – (laughs) <laughs> say we're not going to dance to your tune but we don't have a seatbelt law for adults and we're not going we're not going to have one and i imagine this has held true for many other times too and i think that ability to resist the so-called free money from washington dc is something i don't see uh, in, in the backbones of 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 the political class in other states uh and of course it's we talk about seatbelt laws may seem silly but they're trying to do this right now with red flag gun confiscation orders mm-hmm. saying if you want federal funds, you better have a law in place that allows state agents to confiscate firearms from individuals not charged with any crimes with no due process of the law. They're trying to pass that in Washington, D.C. and and make federal funds contingent to the states uh, on that. So uh, w- the states have got to stand up and say no more of this and fight back. How is New Hampshire, is it just that live free or die attitude? Like how has New Hampshire resisted this temptation for so long? Yeah, I mean, sadly, given the COVID situation and there was a lot of money that came in, New Hampshire's always been a net payer. So we were paying yeah. more to the federal government than we ever received back. And that was actually one of the most compelling arguments I saw for independence, right? It was like, well, we could just make a purely economic argument. We're getting less than we're giving. We're, we're giving more than we're getting. So it just plainly does not make economic sense, regardless of the other reasons. Um, I believe I just read something recently that said that is no longer the case. I have not crunched those numbers myself. I don't really know, given what money was flowing in with what grants. I know that there were there was a lot of concern here about um, some of the. the the grants that were coming in for either vaccinations or for testing, you know, all of the stuff uh, associated with COVID that um, had some bells and whistles in the grant applications that basically said, oh, you are now the federal government's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the polite word is, but you know what I mean. (laughs) And you now have to do what we tell you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so, um, so it is a little troubling. We have really towed, you know, held the line on that for a really long time. I don't think we have a hundred percent, you know, the 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 best record. Now I'm going to assume if we slid, everyone else is way worse than we were, right? So more people are taking more money, but that is definitely something we need to look at. Um, one of the really cool things I think that's coming up for for this legislative session is a constitutional amendment that would be put in front of the voters. So, um, and it's called CACR 32, I believe. And it is an independence bill. It's it's uh, suggesting that we should amend the New Hampshire constitution to just peacefully go our separate way from the federal government. And I'm sure to some extent, it's just an issue of starting that conversation as a more formal thing than me just, you know, going around the country talking to random people about it. But, um, 
But, you know, it's interesting, again, when I was at that conference in Miami, people were like, well, but what if it passes? You know, because I was like, don't worry, it'll take 10 years. Well, you know, we have time and we can figure out the details, get the policy right, make sure we're, you know, energy independent with some nuclear. Like, there's a lot of exciting things we, we can and should be doing. Um, but then someone was like, it's been really weird politically. What happens if this just passes? And I was like, <laughs> if that is the will of granite staters, then let's do it, right? There's nothing undemocratic about what we're suggesting. You know, it's very democratic. One hundred percent, right? I mean, I think you know the pushback would really come from the federal government, but it's a bill that would put it in front of voters. Uh, we have passed several constitutional amendments in the 12, 13 years I've been here, including a really good privacy bill that has to do with information and government interference in our personal information, which I would love to see a lawsuit get pushed on some of this, uh, you know, vaccine tracking and all of that. Um, I should also mention one of the really good things that came out of 2021 was we do have a no vaccine mandate um, ban. So, so we can't have forcible vaccinations. Uh, you can as a private company and as it should be, although like my freedom part doesn't really like this because I do feel like we're using private companies or the federal government is kind of strong arming yeah. private companies to do their dirty work for them. Uh, but the private companies can still have a mandate as a condition of your employment. The hospitals have done that and uh, they have done it with healthcare. But everyone else cannot, you know, they cannot institute a, a um, you know, <laughs> bear with me, a super callous fascist, risky, and experimental doses. Wait, super callous, fascist, risky, experimental doses with a spoonful of sugar. <laughs> so, um, so that was a big win too. Uh, but because the federal dollars are attached to that, I think things got a little murky and we're going to have to parse yeah. that out. You know, I, I, I'll say, you know, Here's one idea I, I've I've been pushing more and more, and I've been talking to some of my state legislator friends across the country about about this idea. Um, you know, is um, standing up to to the federal government through a form of tax nullification. I remember reading just I remember reading Tom Wood's book Nullification years ago, and it was like such a little. It was almost like just on one page. It was like a throwaway thing, but it but it just like it, something clicked in my head, and I thought this is kind of a brilliant idea. Maybe it wouldn't work. Maybe I, I don't know. I think you'd have to have a couple states doing this together to stand up against Washington D.C. But the idea would be, what if, let's say, let's take the state of New Hampshire. What if the state of New Hampshire passed a law saying? The people of New Hampshire no longer pay their federal taxes directly to Washington, D.C. They pay their federal taxes to the state of New Hampshire that holds it in trust. Well, there are legislative committees that review the federal budget and review the items in the federal budget on the basis of constitutionality. And then we will pay to the federal government that percentage, which this legislative committee finds to be constitutional so powers exercised within article 1 section 8 or some other you know place in the constitution where they're actually explicitly granted these powers to do these certain things um you know hey may, hey we're not going to pay for an unconstitutional war in syria that congress never declared we're not going to pay for unconstitutional one size fits all education programs that just you know funnel billions of dollars into bureaucracy and send only the barest minuscule amount to, to classrooms. No, we're not going to pay for that stuff. And then what I like about this idea is that it puts the state in the position of the federal government can't threaten to withhold your federal funds because you've got the federal funds. All right. All right. So you're not going to fund our highways. That's that's fine. We'll fund our own highways. And you know what? Uh, we'll we'll supplant that we'll supplant the money that you threaten to take away with us with these with these funds and then we'll send the rest back to the people that you wanted to steal it from. Um, love it. Love it. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's I'm, I'm making a note tax nullification <laughs> to go with all forms of nullification. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe 2022 after we get this new kind of wave of uh, the red wave, putting liberty legislators into the state capitals across the country, perhaps we can have a renewed effort you know, across the states for something like that. But uh, I, there are so many ways that we need to fight back against the federal government. And I am just, I'm just, you know, 
it's great in so many we've you know we've got liberty legislators in 37 states now but nowhere do we have the nowhere is there the critical mass like there is in new hampshire and i'm just i'm just uh amazed every day the infrastructure the 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 infrastructure that you all have built up over the course of the last 10 years i remember going to my first you know porcupine freedom festival you know in 2012 right after the, the ron paul campaign and it was just packed with people from across the country you know coming to new hampshire this vibrant liberty community and after the ron paul campaigns that seemed to die down a little bit mm-hmm. but geez i went back to pork fest this past year and this was the first year that you guys sold out completely and here's what i love i, I love the community i love the fact that when i go to the porcupine freedom festival it's people who love freedom and liberty and that's a common denominator culturally i mean i i've talked with people there i've talked with people who are you know transgender activists who we would think much more kind of like on the left socially i say more power to them i'm glad that they're in this movement and i talked to very very socially conservative christians who are there too and i say more power to you i'm glad you're in this movement liberty is supposed to be a big tent as long as we agree on these on these foundational principles of I get to live my life how I want, as long as I'm not hurting others, you get to live life how you want, as long as you're not hurting others. And if we disagree on certain things in these personal spheres, then we have the right to use the force of persuasion to try to bring other people to agree with us. But if we can agree that we're not going to use violence, we're not going to use coercion to try to compel peaceful people to live the way that we think they should, you know, then I think that's that's. That's just got the makings for something great that you're bringing all these people together. I look forward to seeing what the, the, the future holds for the Free State Project. And as we go into the future, as we go into here we are in 2022, what are you, I guess, what are you thinking is going to, what, what, what is the Free State Movement going to look like in 2022 and perhaps beyond? So, I mean, we're growing like gangbusters. So I think we're just going to see more and more growth. And, you know, we had, uh, I can't even keep up anymore. I used to know everyone and now there are just thousands of people and there are these move-in parties and sometimes I'll get really nervous. So when a family moves and they bring their U-Haul, if they let us know, hey, we're going to be here at this date, uh, you know, scores of people show up. And something in the back of my mind recently, I was like, gosh, does anyone even like still show up to those? And then I saw a post really right before I came on here where it was this woman who was like, yeah, we we showed up at three o'clock and by 3.15, our truck was unloaded. Like that (laughs) many people just came to help. So I think, you know, our community is going to grow. We have several events that are coming up um, that I'm always excited about. We have Porcupine Day, which will be uh, the first weekend in February. And that's just more a community based thing where we get together to celebrate triggering the move and kind of starting this exodus to our libertarian homeland. And then, uh, of course, we have Liberty Forum, which is the first weekend in March. That's a little more suit and tie. Uh, You know, it's a hotel conference. Uh, Great speakers, Corey DeAngelis, you know, school choice, money. budgets, like all the nerdy wonkish policy kind of stuff, Um, uh, but also community and meeting people and just networking and sort of, you know, building, building our, our, our tribe. And then as you mentioned, uh, yeah, we have a pork fest, the porcupine freedom festival, that's P O R C F E S T. So don't show up and ask me, where's the barbecue? Uh, Cause oh, there are, though, there, every year. <laughs> though there are, there are always vendors uh, that, that uh, set up selling some of the best barbecue and so many other things you'll ever find. Yes. <laughs> and, and we do actually have a pork roast, so it does get confusing, but it is the Porcupine Freedom Festival, as you said, that's going to be June 20th through the 26th. People should buy their tickets as soon as possible. We're already about two thirds sold out. The campground can only handle so many people. It's pretty rough. Stick. Um, I encourage people to buy their tickets and then start to look at hotels around, come camp if you can, find some Airbnbs in the area. I have heard vastly wild rumors about who is going to be showing up, but the names I've heard is everything from, you know, Alex Jones and Tim from Timcast and uh, maybe Joe Rogan. I know Luke Radowski, you know, is always there and will come back. Um, so it really does sound like, you know, if you're ever going to come to one of these, this would be the year to come. That's a good um, reminder. I got to get my ticket before it's too late. 
you know people. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um, it was it, it it was it was actually th- this was this was great. When I went to Pork Fest this past year, it was um, I I got my ticket, but the, all the campsites were were kind of booked at a certain point, and I was like, oh no, what I'm going to do? I should have moved on this sooner. I just put out the word like, hey, has anyone got an open spot on a campsite? And like within minutes, I got like I've heard from a, a you know half dozen people. I end up you know Matt Kibbe of Free the People nice. and his whole clan kind of took me in for <laughs> for the uh, for 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 the week. And uh, it was anyway. And of course they'll be back, and they're going to have this huge hub. And sort of one yeah. of the things we've done this year, which or uh, Dennis Pratt, who's been organizing it, doing a phenomenal job. He uh, he sort of came up with this notion of if we invite other people who are doing cool things to come do little islands of their stuff on the campground, now suddenly we have, you know, a festival that's primarily self-organizing and um, and people are doing what they're passionate about. So you're doing your passion projects, you're meeting people. So free the people will be there again. I'm hoping Dave Smith and Robbie will come out again. Lou Perez will be out. Uh, I'd love to see more comedians. I think, you know, uh, politics is downstream from culture. We've all heard that a million times. Uh, That's why I write books. That's why, you know, I talk uh, and go on the road and all of that. But I think we need more comedians and, you know, face it. I mean, totalitarianism and the, the cognitive dissonance and the irrational, illogical, bananas, crazy stuff we've gone through. I mean, the material just purely writes itself at this stage. Um, And then, so those are sort of the social things and the stuff that, you know, we're just doing community wise. But then we also have, you know, I think we're gonna see some interesting things in the legislature. And I think we're gonna see the most free staters and Liberty people run who have ever run. And I'm pretty hopeful that we can make the Democrats heads explode. (laughs) Well, if you live in, any of these states across America, except for Maine, you got to stay in Maine. <laughs> I'm losing too, I'm a many, <laughs> too many good Liberty people just to, to New Hampshire. Um, but uh, uh, but it, so anywhere other than Maine, if you're looking for a good uh, Liberty community, you'll definitely want to check out the Free State Project in, in New Hampshire. And I will say, you know, I, I got to give credit. My first the first time I was ever exposed to Bitcoin was uh, at the New Hampshire Liberty Forum in 2012. I I met these guys who were just kind of like trying to sell this idea, uh, you know, promote the idea of Bitcoin. And it was new. And I was like, well, I don't know. What is this? And he gave out, he was giving out to people, here, I'll give you five cents worth of Bitcoin. And so I was like, all right. And it was was stuck on my wallet for, you know, I, I checked in on it like, 10 years, like uh, not 10 years, a couple of years later. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this thing is worth $10 now. This was five cents. Mm-hmm. And you know what I think? I should have listened to that guy. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, you you, you should have. And, 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 you know, I had a podcast. It was very briefly lived podcast called Told You So. You can find it on Podbean for the people who are curious. But, you know, we, we free staters were early, early adopters. I bought my first Bitcoin for $6 at Pork Fest. I think it was 2011. That same, like, early crew, right? I mean, I spent yeah. it, you know, so everyone has regrets. Everyone has a sad Bitcoin story. But, you know, I think uh, people are also going to start doing quite well with that. So much so, actually, and I would love to see more crypto businesses come to New Hampshire. Why is crypto important? That federal government and the Federal Reserve collude to steal our money. Inflation is a tax, an invisible tax on the poor. It hurts poor people the most. It is insidious, it is evil, and it needs to stop. They won't listen to us. They won't stop printing money. So we have to take matters into our own own hands. And that is what crypto is. Now, crypto, like any Nansen industry, it's a little scammy. It can be confusing. But if people have questions, come to our events, because most of the people who are involved in that sector here are vetted. We all know each other. It's not the weird, shady, fishy stuff. And come learn because we, you know, crypto is going to be a hedge against inflation. I personally think we may be heading into a hyperinflationary sort of situation. We are definitely not in transitionary. (laughs) We're transitioning to hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. 
Um, but yeah, you know, so everyone's got a sad crypto story, but I would like to see some happy crypto stories come out too. Sadly, we have uh, two different groups of free staters who are, are being pursued by the federal government currently yeah. with regard to crypto. There's the Crypto Six out of uh, Keen. You know, they ran some Bitcoin ATMs. Um, and then, of course, uh, the founder, he also serves on the Free State Project board, Jeremy Kaufman and his company library. And the irony here is the federal government won't tell you or the SEC won't tell you, uh, is it a security? Is it a token? You know, what is it? And if you ask, they'll be like, we don't know. Ask your lawyer. Then you do what your lawyers advise. And then they come back and they're like, well, no, that's not right. And it's like, tell me how to fix it. I would like to be in compliance. And they're like, no, ask your lawyer. So, you know, you'll spend a million, literal million dollars on lawyers and still get pursued. So it is political. We know that uh, they hate crypto because it is so disruptive to their, you know, to their, their interests. I have heard people say, we don't like the libertarians and we don't like the free staters and we don't like the crypto people because the wrong people are getting rich. And I'm like, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is it is the the fiat dollar. And I, and I hate to even call it the dollar because the dollar was, you know, the gold standard. <laughs> right. You know, uh, they destroyed that in uh, uh, over, you know, officially destroyed that in the 70s. And ever since the, the dollar, the dollar is the mechanism by which the empire controls the people and controls the economy and cryptocurrency decentralized finance is a direct challenge to that. They're threatened by it and they should feel threatened by it. And I think that crypto is going to win and amen to that. So uh, we are at the end of the hour. We got to wrap up wow. here, but I know time flies when you, well, I know we have too much fun together. <laughs> Carla, any final words you want to share with folks before we wrap up today? No, I guess, you know, it's Martin Luther King Day. So maybe, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes, I got into so well, many Twitter storms. So oh, we're recording this on later. Martin Luther King Day. This will record now. Well, now everyone's going to see the illusion, but that's fine. We're recording this on Martin Luther King Day. This will air on Sunday. Oh, but we could cut this part out. Say. Oh, I was just going to say, I got a lot of uh, trouble on, on the Twitter sphere today because, you know, I said, I believe like Martin Luther King in the content of people's character. And uh, that is the only thing that we should be judged on as, as humans. Apparently that is racist, but I did want to leave. It's not, of course not. But, um, you know, he did say that the greatest purveyor of violence on earth is my own government. And I think we need to keep that in mind. I want peace. I want prosperity. And we only get that by having small, limited constitutional government or a free and independent New Hampshire. Awesome. Carla, thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And to our audience, thank you so much for watching and listening. If you have not yet subscribed to the Free America Now podcast, so this is the audio podcast, you want to make sure to do that on all of your favorite podcasting apps. Make sure to subscribe. We are putting out content every single Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss a single great Liberty conversation. So be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And furthermore, my opinion is, the Federal Reserve should be destroyed. I'll see you all next week with another Free America Now videocast.